seems like everybody is changing their minds about the idea that COVID leaked from the Wuhan lab. Lots of people seem to have egg on their faces. And then um, on another subject, what about all this massive federal spending and planned tax increases and borrowing to pay for it all? And then again, uh, what's the deal with all this talk about the 2020 vote audits and also about UFOs? Are both those subjects equally crazy or is there maybe something more to the one than to the other? We'll talk about these subjects and more on this edition of the Independent Outlook. Greetings, everybody. I'm Graham Walker, <clears throat> coming to you from the Independent Institute here in Oakland, California. We're right across the bay from San Francisco, and we try and bring you an independent perspective on the issues of the day. Actually, I'm pleased to note that this is our 20th broadcast, and we're grateful to all our friends who've joined in, especially to our friends over at ThinkSpot.com and all those who are listening in and participating through ThinkSpot. And of course, as always, I'm joined by my colleagues, David Thoreau and Williamson Evers. David Thoreau, president of the Independent Institute. Welcome today, David. Thank you, good to see you. Pleasure to see you. Also, Williamson, Bill Evers. Hello, Bill, how are you? I'm well, thank you. It's great to see both of you. And again, uh, this is a lot of fun. I'm doing this 20 times, 20th time. Uh, there's never a lack of things to talk about. <clears throat> In fact, sometimes the news seems to get crazier and crazier. Uh, it's actually still going on that people are talking about what really happened at the Wuhan lab and whether uh, it was a mistake to have dismissed the idea of a lab leak as was done so uh, really vehemently uh, last year. <clears throat> uh, what's the latest on this and why did the Biden administration shut down former Secretary of State Pompeo's probe into the leak? That puzzles me. Either of you have some thoughts on why the Pompeo investigation was shut down? I think it was for political reasons that would have been set in motion by the Trump administration. And not only that, I think they were very worried by this passage in a memo that the Pompeo State Department put out. The United States has determined that the Wuhan Institute of Virology has collaborated on publications and secret projects with China's military. It has engaged in classified research on behalf of the Chinese military since at least 2017. So wow. that was the current thinking of Pompeo as he was going out the door. That was the January 15 uh, information, correct? I recall that was just, a January 15 memo. Yes, yeah, exactly. exactly. And so it, had they allowed the investigation to continue, there might have been built a bigger mountain of evidence on behalf of that. And that would have been embarrassing. Is that why it was well, it stopped? Per perhaps they thought that that wasn't the case or it wasn't important to the it, 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 there, there's also, of course, the question of a conflict of interest. Some of this people making decisions in this had gone on record supporting this kind of chimera type of virology research. Mm -hmm. And it was going on in various places and at various times. And some U.S. money. So, so let's say you give American taxpayers money to the to a intermediary and they give it to this Wuhan Institute. And it's supposedly to go collecting bat feces samples or something like that, or live bat samples. It, okay, that goes into the main pot of the money of, for this institute. Now, you, the donor, the American bureaucrat, can say, well, I didn't pay for gain of function. I didn't pay for chimeras. I just paid for sample collection. But it goes into the big pot. And so, you know, it's completely fungible. So a critic can say, oh, you say you didn't pay for it, but here they're doing it and they're reaping tons of taxpayer money in order to do these projects. So it looked ugly. And so the best thing to do was see if it, time, time would render it irrelevant. Well, the funny thing was that, that uh, President Biden stopped the investigation yeah. that Pompeo started, but then he demanded his own from the intelligence community, so-called, within 90 days. David, I think you had a comment in here somewhere. I don't want to miss your, your comment on the subject, David. Well, CNN claimed that the reason why it was dropped was because the quality of evidence uh, in, in the investigation was lacking or was not credible. And it was basically 
you know, echoing the view that Trump is just making wild assertions for his own political reasons. And, uh, but, you know, clearly the intelligence agencies knew about this earlier. Uh, commissioning a new 90 day study is just politics. And uh, this, you know, the project that Pompeo was pursuing was perfectly legitimate. And uh, it's a political, political decision. And you know what, what Biden wants to try to duck is that Trump didn't know what he was doing. He was making wild assertions without, without evidence, but now we're gonna get the facts. And we were misled before, uh, but now it looks like this is the case. So they're, they're basically trying to, it's like the vaccine issue. Biden's trying to claim credit for the vaccines. It's the same kind of a thing. And I think we have to just recognize that this is not unique to the Democrats. No. Let's say it was a transition between the Biden and the Trump administration and some Union kind of- in reverse. Yeah. Uh, I'm just saying it wouldn't be crazy for the Trump people to want to restart something that was a problematic or hot potato type thing and make sure that they, that the people doing the work felt they owed their appointment to the Trump administration. And maybe they're not going to distort things, but they'll give them a heads up earlier and so that they can be prepared and that sort of thing. That's kind of how the politics and bureaucracy work. Right, but I think it's important to point out that the, the COVID uh, pandemic was used for political reasons. Absolutely. And so this is again, trying to position yourself yeah. in, a, in a good it, position. It, it, it was you know, Fauci was, that's right. You know, Fauci was, is the high priest of the COVID epidemic shutdowns and all the rest of it, and his flip-flopping and denials and what have you. And certainly. so Biden, Biden comes in and he uh, promotes it. And, Certain, uh, certainly flip-flopping on mask wearing, flip-flopping yep. on the numbers involved in herd immunity, yep. flip-flopping on just so many things that seem like blowing in the wind. Virtually everything. But I think the most, the most key, you know, the key part about Fauci, of course, is that he and, and Francis Collins were uh, in directly and intimately involved in changing the policy um, that was banned by the Obama administration about gain of function research funding and operations. Mm -hmm. uh, and they funded a lab that they'd worked with for years in China, uh, which had low standards of safety and had a direct contact to the Chinese military not just the Chinese military, but the Chinese propaganda entities. I mean, within the lab, there are all these stories or videos of scientists in meetings, basically re-education classes, and they're, they're expressing their loyalty to the Chinese Communist Party. So it's, this is not top secret stuff, um, but they tried to uh, paper it over and ignore it and, and claim that they were above the fray when in reality they use this and they're still using it. And Americans have died and uh, American society has been changed in many substantial ways, not to say it can't be restored in important ways, but you know, the last uh, year and a half, whatever, uh, has been uh, traumatic and there's no one really being held accountable for it. Did you notice this fascinating paper from Dr. Fauci that recently reemerged from 2012, where he was discussing the risks of this kind of virology research? And he, he says, he asks rhetorically in this paper in 2012, what if the scientist becomes infected with the virus, <clears throat> which leads to an outbreak and ultimately triggers a pandemic? He goes on to say, scientists working in this field might say, as indeed I have said, that the benefits of such experiments and the resulting knowledge outweigh the risks. Mm -hmm. That's Dr. Fauci in 2012. So right. he was quite aware of the risks. He himself had downplayed the risks. And so when the question arose as to whether uh, the COVID virus had emerged from the lab where this uh, research was taking place, when that question arose, you can see how 
you'd want to downplay that hypothesis if you had already stated publicly that you thought the risks were worth it. Um, you wouldn't really want to do that. And I can see the pressure of that situation might have been tough to take. I, I want to potentially, I, <laughs> I'm pretty funny here for me to be defending Dr. Fauci. But, you know, we're in danger of doing something like what was done with nuclear power after the meltdown. Uh, suddenly, nuclear power, which was an extremely safe thing, uh, became liquidated. And, you know, just because China did a bad job with safety protocols and Russia and Chernobyl did a bad job with safety protocols, mm -hmm. doesn't mean that we should end virology research. These are very dangerous pathogens. We need to understand them. I right, think but, so. So we have to be, yes. Yes, there but are, there the are, point China here did, is that China you're weaponizing. There was, a there was a cover up. There was a cover up. There, is a, there and, is a danger of military, uh, you know, germ warfare type situations here. Right. But I don't think this should lead us to end virology research. Yeah, no, one's no I don't think that. we're talking about that, Bill, but I think well, we are talking about weaponizing virology re research to create uh, basically pathogens that would create a worldwide pandemic of I, I unbelievable am a, proportions. I am against germ warfare. The United States is in international treaties that forbid it. However, just speculating here and without firsthand knowledge, I do not doubt that the U.S. is secretly doing germ warfare research. Probably so. And I think that's the reason why Fauci, there are a number of reasons, but one of the major reasons why Fauci did not even mention any of this in all the meetings with, uh, at the White House and with the media and everybody else is because he wanted it to be a secret. Yeah. He, did, he, did, he wanted to be a secret because that's, what they were, that's how they were pursuing it. Mm. And also he didn't want to be held accountable for it. One more shot at another angle on this one, which, which I think is not uh, what government agencies or actors were doing, but rather the question of how the media covered it. Um, the whole question of downplaying the lab leak you know, last year. Um, I really was absolutely fascinated by this piece in the Washington Post, oh, a week and a half ago roughly, mm -hmm. uh, by Aaron Blake, which seems to be a kind of, um, I don't know, introspection on the part of the Washington Post. Uh, where they acknowledge here, a couple of phrases, interesting. Washington Post says in this piece, it has become evident that some corners of the mainstream media overcorrected when it came to one particular theory from Trump and his allies that the coronavirus emanated from a laboratory in Wuhan, China. Um, but then the, the argument is that they overcorrected, but they couldn't help it because they say Trump and his allies invited and deserved skepticism. And so President Trump's credibility, they say, was so low because he had been so irresponsible on other subjects that it was understandable for the mainstream media to poo-poo the assertion which he seemed to be making and others in his administration that the virus could have leaked out of a lab. How could they help but downplay something that Trump was upplaying because Trump had been so irresponsible? Now, that's a really interesting argument. It has an element of truth to it. Um, well, but I, I mean, I want it. yeah, I think I think that's true. And also, the the way this was handled was because of the Lancet article, uh, and also the uh, intelligence agencies claimed, about at the same time, that there is no evidence for uh, the lab leak, uh, or the lab source story, and uh, so uh, it was basically using science as the cover, science as the cover, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when in reality it was not, there was no science at all. I mean, there's no science at all that could defend the view that it was, it, it was something that naturally evolved, and yet all the circumstantial evidence seemed to point, and they're talking about a, over a year ago, mm -hmm. the evidence all pointed to a circumstantial case that the Wuhan lab was a source. And, and that was poo-pooed and ridiculed and, and so forth. And, but, you know, it, it also is in keeping with the fact that the elite culture uh, is not based on the science. It's based on an ideology 
uh, somewhat imprecise in some respects, but otherwise dominant. And if things don't match and, su and sustain that narrative, it's the enemy and it needs to be derided. Hence, we're, we're the anointed ones to interpret things and to continue to rule. So when, when Biden comes in, of course, the first thing you have to do is you have to scrub uh, all the things that were claimed or whatever, even if they were successful. Uh, and uh, without even considering those things that were not successful, that were foolishly done uh, during the Trump period, uh, there's no assessment of uh, what to do about that. I mean, it's, it's just really amazing. To see. It, it, it goes back to, in some respects, Hayek's book, The Road to Serfdom, why the worst get on top mm. and so forth. And uh, uh, in, in Fauci's case, what he's been saying on TV interviews is that I am science. I am science, and if you don't like it, you're not scientific. And whatever I say, and I can change my mind based on whatever I say. So I think that's, that's, that being questioned now is a, is a very positive and encouraging sign. I think that this mea culpa in the Post and other elite media is encouraging on that level, but also illuminating because, as I say, this piece in particular, um, which um, admits that there was uh, overcorrection, errors, and so forth, that there was a mistake to call it debunked and so forth. Um, the, the argument Col being- Columbia Journalism Review has said something along the same lines. Too. Right. right. What's happening though, is that the people in the elite me media, <clears throat> they fail to see that the, the elite media really have now been demonstrated to have exactly the same problem that they accused Trump of having, namely, diminished credibility due to a political agenda and carelessness. Um, turns out that in this case, they're acknowledging that there was you know, a degree of a political agenda, but they couldn't help it because Trump had a political agenda. They were reacting to Trump's political agenda, or they were careless because Trump had been careless. And I suppose one could say this, that the only difference really between the mainstream media error and the Trump error, error is that uh, the mainstream media use a much more sophisticated vocabulary uh, yeah. and a much, much more modulated tone of voice to achieve their spin uh, than Trump did. And I'm not really sure that a modulated, sophisticated sounding spin is really more admirable than a rough, coarse and, you know, jibing kind of spin. Well, Both kinds a, of spins There's another bad. dimension to it, Graham. And the other, the other part of it is the mainstream is essentially an enabler of the Washington establishment, the swamp, the deep state, whatever you want. They, they're they invested in it, they believe in it. Ideologically, they, they, uh, they obviously benefit in many different ways. There's collusion uh, and so on. Uh, there's a revolving door. Uh, many of the top people in the mainstream media were in the Carter administration or whatever, Obama and so on. That's understandable, but I think there's a certain um, objective uh, lesson to be learned about the nature of politics and political power and centralization of power and the way ideas are manipulated to uh, stay in power and to attack, attack enemies. And I think that one of the things that was very positive and sort of refreshing about the Trump period was that it wasn't a group of people uh, but not completely by any means, but it brought in a group of people who were not part of the swamp. And they were looking at it in a more independent way and could see the folly in it. And they were trying to make changes. And many of the changes were positive, others were not. But I think uh, falling back to machi the machine politics that the Democratic Party really represents today, um, as far as Washington is concerned, is not to say the Republican Party doesn't have machines too, but the Tammany Hall kind of machine politics, which is really what Biden is about, um, it doesn't really re represent any ideas. It's basically catering to the interest group. Uh, it's an amalgamation of interest groups. Right, there's an array of, of mm -hmm. interest groups mm -hmm. and they want goodies and they want power and they, they have their own agenda and so forth. And he caters to that. He's always done that. So, so, so I, have, I have another 
thought. And that is, and this ties in with later stories, it used to be that journalists not only would dig into stuff, but they and, they, and would say one person says this and another person says that. But currently they seem to be leaping to say, and the second person is false, is a liar, is saying something that's been totally debunked without having done an in-depth news analysis that shows that. So if you think back to the very early days of discussion of the lab leak versus the animal leap the idea, I, I read maybe one or two stories trying to explain why the animal leak idea was correct. It had to do with the configuration of the you know, the molecules and so forth in, in the virus and how they attached and things like that. But some of the same stuff is going on now in terms of showing that the lab leak and design better explains the configuration of the molecules. There was a little bit of that, but it was not very present to people. Now, I know it's sort of boring and technical, but if you're going to lay down that the thing is debunked, is false, is a lie, you need at least one or two times in a prominent place to be explaining that. Yeah, and, yeah. That, and, we, didn't, and we didn't see it. We didn't, we didn't see, see it, it, and it goes worse than that, Bill, because it wasn't just what you're saying, which is true is that they had no interest and didn't even begin to look at the evidence. It was some completely dismissed. Uh, speaking of the new approach to politics coming out of the Biden administration, President Biden was involved in some apparently protracted negotiations with Republican congressional leaders about stimulus spending and budget and so forth and taxes, and he decided to pull the plug on those yeah. uh, negotiations. Senator Capito from West Virginia and others this is were the, involved. This is this is the infrastructure bill. Mm -hmm. yep. And they've been trying, you know, here's the thing where both the Democrats and the Republicans could spend big money, right? And mm -hmm. lavish things on their own districts and all this sort of thing. So the Democrats just seem to want to do too much. They wanted to escape the normal meaning of infrastructure. They wanted to have programs that were training programs and not physical structures. They wanted to raise taxes in order to do it. They didn't want any user fees. They didn't want to take any of unspent COVID relief money. They, they still money. want all that. Right. They want to double down on all those things. And so that's why they broke off. However, they found a common core in spending industrial policy money on science, technology, biotech, supposedly in the name, is in the name of rivalry with China. So now we're two uh, mercantilists. So Republicans can buy to, into that spending. Right, that they, that they were able to find common ground. And, and, you know, there are some people, Mike Lee, Ron Johnson, so forth, who said, no, this is a boondoggle. No, we're trying to turn the United States into the Chinese system in order to supposedly succeed in the contradistinction to yeah, China. Interesting argument, and, huh? Yeah, I think it's a true argument. You know, sometimes when the Republicans and Democrats get together and agree about spending more money, it kind of feels yeah. to me like an episode of Wheel of Fortune. Come on, big money. And and, <laughs> and they spin the wheel and then they can agree on big money on a, a few categories. Did. They certainly did on this Endless Frontier Act. I call it the Endless Spending Act myself. <laughs> And, and for those of you who don't know uh, basically how this act would be set up, the way it is set up primarily is that you uh, uh, have, and this is part and parcel with the, the tax proposals and other things, is that you raise the tax rate, you increase regulations, and then you offer two different businesses the opportunity to get subsidies if they will pursue their work in certain ways. So it's basically industrial policy. Mm -hmm. right. And it, it's, it's picking carrot. winners, picking losers. Picking winners, it's industrial policy. It's very much in keeping with the progressive tradition it is. of central planning, which is what is sometimes called corporatism. Yeah. And is what 
taken to a certain extreme is what Mussolini proposed. That's right. But it certainly is corporate welfare, no it's matter. corporate welfare on a what, huge scale. That's right. right. So with this kind of, with this massive degree of spending, if they can agree on it, necessitate more taxes and or more inflation? Well, there's only so many different ways you can pay for things. Right. And, you know, borrowing, eventually it's taxes of some sort. And inflation is a kind of tax because it decreases the value of the money people are holding. Right. Mm -hmm. So they're doing, you know, they're trying all the different ways. They borrow a lot including from Chinese, they tax and they inflate. And the question is, you know, there's a lot of talk about how the inflation that we're seeing right now is just temporary and it's not going to be a problem. But many important economists say no. And Martin Wolf just had a column in the Financial Times of London saying, this looks very much like the 1970s. Uh, it's going to be very, they're, they're keeping it loose for a long time into the future. And that's going to mean when they pull back, as Volcker did, it's going to have a violent dislocation. Well, don't ever pull back. Well, there's that. <laughs> that that's <laughs> Problem the modern, solved. <laughs> that's the modern monetary theory uh, that uh, in, in uh, caricature believes money grows on trees. Or from helicopters. All right. That's, uh, okay, so I think the, the summary here is uh, pay attention, and uh, let's just hope the American public pays enough attention not to let their various representatives find common ground always on spending more money. Well, as, been, and as Larry Kudlow pointed out, the tax burden that the Biden people are proposing would mean the burden on Americans would be heavier than China's. That's good right. Grief. Heavier than China, and heavy, I mean... To Kudlow's credit, when he was in the White House, he was able to get through a measure that was adopted in the Congress to cut tax rates and uh, the corporate tax and others. And uh, that created a huge boom uh, and wages went up as a result, also with the deregulation and so on. And what Biden is proposing is to eliminate that and actually to raise taxes really across the board and there's not enough money in the economy to pay for these trillions of dollars of debt. And this mon modern monetary theory view is crank economics. Mm -hmm. and so there's, a, there's another aspect to that, and that is the Biden people realize that all these proposals there are going to require, as we're talking about, is going to be inflation, borrowing, or tax. Mm -hmm. And they're worried that the amount of tax they're going to impose will make the United States unattractive as a place to do business. Right. So the, so the way to counter that is to make every place <laughs> in the world an unattractive place mm -hmm. to do business, and then yeah. people will stay where they are, and that's this global minimum tax. Yes, and so it's not, all part... Not, on, not only is it full of tons of tiny language red tape yep. that will trap people, but it it's it's going to definitely undermine American competitiveness, even though they're hoping that it won't make it as bad as it otherwise would. I don't think it's going to, I don't think it's going to happen because I think the trend of things like uh, Brexit and all the rest of it around the world are going to fight against it. Yeah, in the opposite direction. And I think that the public is f f massively more untrusting of Washington than ever before. Yeah, but they've already got agreement in principle from yeah. all these other top well, industrial countries. That's what they're trying to set up. But I think that there's no way it's going to be a global, a global thing is what I I'm mean, trying to say. And I think there'll be a sufficient number of major places Tax that aims. will not go along with it because right. there's no yeah. law that says they have to. Right. right. Exactly. And from a competitive tax standpoint, they're going to benefit. Right. But just so think, I think if they succeeded. If they succeeded, and, and the Biden administration folks should be thinking about this, if they succeeded, what would that mean? Even if it can't succeed, but if it did, what would it mean for um, liberty of individuals around the world? So much for voting with your feet, there'd be absolutely no escape. That's right, right. And, that's, that's their goal. That's actually. their goal, that's right. And it's all part of the so-called great reset where you have central world central planning and it's, 
it's for climate reasons, it's for equity reasons, it's for oh, you right. name there's, it, right? Yeah. There's, a all, there's a panoply of reasons, but guess what? Some set of people end up with the power and the money. <laughs> That's right, exactly. And okay. you end up with this ruling class. The ruling class is, has, lo has been steadily losing its standing in the United States. Right, right. And hence the rebellion with you know the, the trend, Trump movement, MAGA movement, whatever, and there are other aspects that reflect this too. Yeah, I mean, and so I think that what we're the Tea Party was a reflection of it. absolutely the Tea Party was a reflection of it, and I think that the audits that are that are spreading now in different states for the November third election is is that's part of this. I think the uh, displacement uh, of Fauci as the high priest of American science and, and governance is part of this. Uh, and I, it, it's just going to, the problem with a cartel, as Adam Smith pointed out, is that a cartel is a bunch of competitors that get together because they think they have a mutual uh, reason to raise prices, but they can only do it if they do it in Collusively. It, that's right. But, to, but since but every the actual market- has Every member has an, an incentive right. to chisel, to, to yeah. hide <laughs> under the table, not going along with the cartel. There's so the that's, actual... why, that's why David thinks they will not hold together in their tax no. cartel. Hopefully. Right. I mean, and the, the bottom line for Smith in his book, The Wealth of Nations, essentially, I mean, his book was an attack on so-called mercantilism, right. which was government royal privilege, monopoly privileges. So his but, point is that you don't have to have royalty in order to have this because no. this whole thing with industrial policy is China is already a mercantilist state. America is too much of a mercantilist state. But things like this China related industrial policy makes us even more a full fledged mercantilist corporate monopoly state type thing. Right. So the, the point getting back to Smith for a second is that for all these competitors to stay in line, uh, since the actual market price is lower than the monopoly price, as Bill said, there's enormous incentives to cheat behind the backs of the other cartel members. So the way you keep the cartel members in line is through policing. You have to force them in line. The mafia does it by breaking people's legs in the back alley. They can't mm -hmm. do it in public. Um, and the only way the government can, can, can get away with it in public is they put some sort of uh, veneer that this is actually serving the people when actually it's ripping them off. Um, but I think that the incentives are so huge uh, to fight against this. And I think the credibility, i.e. this veneer, uh, that the government is claiming is wearing thinner and thinner for people. This, you know, they, the COVID was the big veneer in the last uh, 16 to 18 months. And that's totally falling apart. Right. So, so I, I, I think I, we should. I think we should take up the topic you raised about uh, the 2020 vote, various audits that are going on, various uh, laws that are being proposed in the states. What the progressives' line is on the laws that are going on in the states. Well, here's. A, because, I'm going to make a comment on that as we start because I'm just struck as we as we have this conversation about these parallels. I think David is implicitly saying the same thing, that with regard to the lab leak theory, um, it was floated way back when people in the elite media said, not even worth pursuing because look who's floating it. <clears throat> okay, so now skip to vote audits. Um, you know, uh, the wrong people are suggesting that we need vote audits, so don't even pursue it. Don't even do audits. Right. It, it just seems the same kind of uh, like a reflex of deference to elite opinion. And elite opinion is just, it's not worth genuflecting automatically to elite opinion. I say, if there's a question about vote integrity, do the audits. I mean, find out, you know, and then right. the thing, if there's nothing try there. And, you, and try and do a professional job of it. Yeah, exactly. You know? if, uh, if it's a big point, nothing burger, you'll prove it's a big nothing burger. So wouldn't okay, we be all and, be better off then? So I would say this, you know, the best time to deal with problems of voting is before the vote. Absolutely. <laughs> it's much harder to figure out what happened afterwards because you have, you know, you have a lot of electronic stuff. You have 
you know, people, it's not, it's a secret ballot, you know, <laughs> have written names on each one and so forth. They call it an Australian ballot. So if you're an American firster, you should be against it. But anyway, that's a joke. Uh, we need to have, as, as was said by someone, a prophylactic approach. In other words, the laws that, that the various voter integrity laws that are being proposed now, signature matching, thumbprints, voting in person, no voter harvesting, all these different ideas are good because they mean you don't have the doubt afterwards because you know the process was done as close to being right as possible. We also know for sure that Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin did things that were really unconstitutional. Wisconsin changed the law, you know, just voting officials changed the law. We, uh, when you say unconstitutional, you mean in violation of Wisconsin's state constitution. No, he's I, talking about in violation of the U.S. Constitution. Yeah. The U.S. Constitution very specifically stipulates yeah. that election the laws on the state level have to be state adopted by state legislatures mm -hmm. and no one else. A governor, mm -hmm. the attorney general, some commissioner, mm -hmm. they have that's, no that's authority. That's exactly right. So, so here's what Rand Paul says. I think he's pretty accurate on this. In Wisconsin, tens of thousands of absentee votes had only the name on them and no address. Yeah. So the name is on the envelope, not on the vote itself. Historically, all such votes were thrown out. This time, they dismissed this concern that had previously been in the rule. Mm -hmm. And that, to make this change after the fact, ex post facto, without legislative, uh, th that's, that's unconstitutional. You can't be doing that. And in Pennsylvania, officials made it, not the legislature. So it was done in the name of COVID panic and all, but it all had one tendency to not scrutinize, to not carefully make sure that only eligible people were voting and to make sure they won't, weren't voting multiple times and, and the other things that we're concerned about, that dead people weren't voting. We know there are documented instances of this. Now, do we now know that this overturns the election? I don't think we have the complete evidence for that, but you know, for the journalists to say that this theory is debunked is missing the fact that no journalists of national stature have gone in and dug into what the amounts would really be. Right. And it's, so they're jumping the gun. Well, it's not only that, it's also that, I mean, what we're talking about is what a normal audit consists right. of, a so-called right. full forensic audit, okay? Now, the IRS does audits, and there are different types of audits. Full forensic audit is the most complete audit. And a, and a business and whoever, that's what they face. The Pendant Institute has its own Absolutely. internal audit. We have to, exactly. If Every a check year. is written, we have to, you know, who who authorized the check? Did it go There's to a genuine vendor? All Any there good objective company. objective standards that right. are used exactly. for that. Okay, so it turns out that there's never been a full forensic audit across the country ever in the United States of voting voting records. Never. There's never been, in other words, the people who claim we don't, we don't that there's want, no evidence, that there's want, no evidence. We don't evidence want the national government to do it. We want I, I'm not saying the local. national government. I just, I, I wanted to clarify that. For okay, what I'm trying to say is that the people who say there's, there's no evidence of voter fraud have no evidence that that's true. They have no evidence whatsoever. And yet all the circumstantial evidence, again, is pointing to the question of why were these why were these voting uh, procedures changed so there's no accountability? Well, in you know the history of voter fraud is full of these uh, circumstances in which people could defraud voting, and countries around the world, in Europe and elsewhere, have faced the same problem, and they've adopted these measures, signatures and what have you, uh, that per, that reduce the likelihood of it. So anyway, my point is. What's happening now is that, that in Maricopa County in Arizona is really the first full forensic audit ever done after an election in the history of the United States. Wow. And so what's happening now 
is that state legislators from Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Georgia and many other states are going to Maricopa County to uh, go to a classroom discussion, a presentation, what they're doing, and then they have essentially a tour of how the whole thing was set up, and they're interested in adopting this in other states. So again, getting back to Bill's, I mean, to uh, Graham's point, is that don't we want to have legitimate, honest elections where people can have their vote counted? Of course we do. So what is the problem in having a full forensic audit all the time? Don't, isn't I, that really the way to go? Or at least to eliminate those, those measures that the probability is foster that irregularity. Fraud occur. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. My, so my, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to downplay the idea of official audits, journalistic investigations. I, I think that's a good idea. We should be for that. We want the facts out. But I, my stress is on fixing it going forward mm -hmm. because it's too too hard to find out what happened. And it's definitely too hard to reverse an election once it's been certified. Right, so Bill, the, 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 I'm, I'm, again, I'm not saying we shouldn't look into it. I'm just the saying advantage of, the people uh, who are attacking these preventative laws and saying, oh, this is racial suppression and on and on, they are the ones that are the, the worst people in this situation. It's not some person who might be doing a sloppy audit or something. You, know, you should also pay attention to sloppiness in that. But the worst people are the ones that are trying to prevent these careful laws. I think the, the good news in all of this is that if you look at the polls, it's like 70% of Republicans believe that there's major voter fraud, something like 35 to 40 percent of Democrats. And so that's a huge percentage of the public. And the way to start is to look at what happened and what should not have happened and to adopt measures that will uh, essentially enable accountability. Um, the momentum usually in politics and governance is uh, the squeaky wheel approach. If you know if there's not enough attention to it, just let it go. Right. So that's what people like Stacey Abrams and others have been c counting on. They want to attack anybody who raises questions of being mm -hmm. uh, someone who's trying to do voter suppression and so on. And we don't want to change it. And HR one, which fortunately looks like would have, not, what, is, would have covered all this up. Right. Would, would essentially institutionalize all these different. Uh, Factors, that, that, measures that, that would that foster right. voter yes. irregularity right. and fraud. So I think that any way any way you look at it, uh, quite frankly, if you if you're a Democrat, if you're a Republican, if you don't believe there is voter fraud, if you do believe there's voter fraud, let's take a look at what there is, right. and let's figure out how to eliminate. It, you know, it, I think a lot of the reaction to this stems from a kind of irrational fear. Um, you hear you hear this from people on all sides of the spectrum, but one big version of it is, well, if we do voter audits and do the Maricopa County thing, then that's going to lead to some kind of Myanmar style, you know, coup. We put Trump back in power. No, that's not the point in the slightest. Uh, the point is to find out if you can what went wrong so that you can prevent bad things like that happening in the future. Things like irregularities as like, in If there were any, that's right. right. And so I think Senator Paul actually was just very exemplary in the comments. Right. He said, for instance, he said, Senator Rand Paul, I voted to certify the state electors because I think it would be wrong for Congress to overturn that. But at the same time, I'm not willing to just sit here and say, oh, anybody on the Republican side is a liar and there's no fraud. No, there were there, lots of there problems. There were many, many instances, um, including in the Senate, of election results that were determined that were fraudulent and that person was replaced. Right, so but, so this, but in this case- It's not unprecedented, but I think the minimum point, I think we'd all agree on, is that the only way we're gonna uh, ensure election integrity um, is to eliminate these measures that induce fraudulent behavior and people can get away with it. Let's just uh, turn the corner. Um, we were also intrigued by a number of other news items this week. Uh, for example, Bill Evers, you brought to my attention 
uh, that the, both the mayor of New York and the governor of New Jersey are now forbidding online learning. What's the right. deal with that? So here's the headline in the New York Times. New York City will eliminate remote learning for next school year. And here's the Trenton paper, the capital of New Jersey. New Jersey schools won't be allowed to offer any virtual learning options next year, Murphy says. Murphy is the governor of New Jersey. So the really interesting thing is, this, this is that, that the unions have always shied away from charter schools, even magnet schools, sco opportunity scholarship programs, tax credits, anything where parents have some kind of choice. Well, here's a situation where about 20% of the parents say, actually, my kid thrived under distance learning, virtual learning, whatever you want to call it, okay? And so, of course, that means 80% <laughs> did not thrive, all right? But they're trying to crush an option for parents because they want one size fits all. This is the most convenient for the unions. They're, they're not encouraged by the idea that 20% of the kids might be taught by one teacher somewhere remotely, and that might be effective and efficient for those students. So they're trying to crush this deliberately. So that, that you know, struck me as really unfair to the students that thrive under those conditions and could go at their own pace and so forth. So it, it, distance which learning, goes, which goes if, it, if it works, if when distance learning works, it has a lot of advantages for the student, both the slow student and the fast student. The slow student can go over it and go over it and go over it and can get, you know, usually help from a tutor of some sort that the school provides. And the fast student can keep going instead of being held back by the classroom situation. Mm -hmm. And in addition, of course, just what, a month ago and the previous year, the unions were saying the right. only thing you could do is distance learning. And not only that, de Blasio, the mayor of New York, promised that when they did reopen, he would have a distance learning option. Mm -hmm. However, in a Fauci-type flip-flop, <laughs> He's gone along, surprise, he's gone along with the unions. Right, yep. Uh, I also was curious to, to notice uh, that apparently the New York Times has been covering um, an internal dispute or even an internal kind of ideological war within the ACLU over the subject of free speech. I thought the ACLU was always for free, free speech, but apparently yeah. not so. What's the deal on that? Either of you know? Well, well, it was this was great reporting by Michael Powell of the New York Times, mm -hmm. and he interviewed both sides extensively. So the two sides are progressives who say the ACLU is a racial justice organization. Mm -hmm. And the other side says it's a First Amendment, free speech, free press, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion association. And which is what it was, liberty. which is what it was founded as. Now it was founded by leftists, but it yeah. was founded by leftists who sincerely believed in individual liberty, and so this fight is happening. And the younger people, this is not uniform, but the tendency is that the younger people, the newer hires, are people that want cancel culture, mm -hmm. and the older people who think cancel culture is a violation of free speech. And one of the obvious areas that is interesting is that the ACLU is not defending students, including students in state universities where there's an obvious state interest involved, who are having their speech repressed. Whereas in the olden days, the ACLU was defending Nazis uh, marching in Skokie and various other unpopular people but despite that, they were upholding freedom of, the, of speech and of the press and so forth. So this is a big war uh, for the campuses. A new group called FIRE has come into existence. Mm -hmm. Also, Harmeet Dillon has a group that does a lot of campus defense. Mm -hmm. She's a San Francisco attorney. Uh, and there are, other, there are other groups that work on this, but the ACLU is having a serious civil war.
within and the federal also ranks. On their, it's been also a fight on their board now for a number of years. One of our advisory yeah. board members, Wendy Kaminer, quit yeah. over this issue. Wow. So if you look in their annual report, it's on and on of all the stuff that they fought Trump on. And there's nothing about the First Amendment in their annual report. Yeah. Right. And well, I, thought I think they were fundamentally all about... it's another example of, of the problem with progressivism because progressivism doesn't believe in property rights and doesn't believe in individual uh, empowerment in many respects. It, it's, it's really rooted in sort of a collectivist ideology. And so as mm -hmm. a result, if, you get, if push comes to shove, you're gonna side with collectivism. And that's what the younger types are doing. And uh, you can't have it both ways. Well, the ACLU is gonna have to choose because the road diverges. Yep, that's and right. I thought another, another thing that we should give the New York Times credit for is that when Vice President Harris uh, went to Guatemala, she's just been there, uh, they ran a front page story on U.S. foreign aid to Central America and specifically to Guatemala, mm -hmm. in which they went in, they went in on the ground, they went to villages, they talked to villagers, they also talked to experts, and they said U.S. foreign aid is not leading to development in Central America or in Guatemala. It's lining the pockets of the elite in that country. It's lining the pockets of Beltway Bandits, which is the nickname for people who specialize in taking federal contracts and executing them, situated around the Beltway, the highway that runs around Washington, D.C. So these are the people who walk off with the money. It's not something, it's not like a commercial investment where somebody hopes to make a profit by serving people and giving them products. These are programs that are handouts and subsidies. Now, Vice and they President, don't, they don't lead to prosperity. She went to there to, to to Guatemala to shower more foreign aid on these mm -hmm. on these areas, and thinking that somehow that's going to change things. And this New York Times story honestly said, and it was it was very, you know, commendable that they said this. It has not diminished refugee flow, migrant flow. It has not. You know, when Vice President Harris uh, has said that she wants to address the root causes behind, you know, the mass migration up to El Norte, it has an element of truth um, to it. After all, people are sometimes desperate, certainly poor, uh, and I are politically oppressed in their home countries. Uh, it kind of makes sense to, you know, solve the problem at its source. But what doesn't make sense is how she then would operationalize her insight about root causes, as if somehow aid transfers are the same thing as addressing root causes. Well, how she, about also, she also was claiming that it's all because of, of global warming, climate change. Right. Uh, and this goes, this goes back to uh, another former, one of our friends, Peter Bauer, the economist from, from London, uh, and he basically showed that uh, the, in addition to the cronyism of foreign aid, aid that Bill's referring to, what foreign aid does is that it destroys local businesses because people get goods and services for free, it's filtered through the bureaucracy mm. of that mm -hmm. corrupt government, and it destroys local businesses. And so uh, a farmer can't sell his product because people are getting grain for free Right. And so the economy is in, in the tank and continues to be or goes even lower and then people migrate. So oh, this, this story, whole foreign aid, this story it, it's, in the New it's York like, Times. It's like, it's like aid to cities. It's like all sorts of welfare state mm -hmm. policies. Mm -hmm. The Biden crowd is trying to claim that extended high unemployment benefits do not incent people not to work. It has nothing to do with their not working. I mean, that's laughable. It's laughable. Oh, so Absolutely. this New York Times story, again, commendably said that the areas that had the most foreign aid in Guatemala had the less, lesser amount of development, mm -hmm. of economic course. prosperity. Of course, of course. It just so logical. So they were empirically yeah. fulfilling uh, mm -hmm. the hypothesis advanced by Peter Bauer. Exactly. That's right. And this is the big difference between Peter Bauer, say, and someone like Jeffrey Sachs who's a big apologist for foreign aid and, and, and urban uh, uh, central planning in developing countries. Because a lot of US foreign aid, like some of the domestic aid that you were mentioning, David, does have that. In fact, it's the, well, let's hope it's an unintended consequence, but it has the consequence of enfeebling 
private initiative yes. and calcifying the central state and its cronies, which therefore right. leads to a weakening of individual economic initiative, a weakening of the sense of private property being sacrosanct and therefore greater impoverishment. I would like to see a U.S. president, U.S. vice president, let's say in this case, going to Central and South America, <clears throat> advocating for and linking arms with those who support reform in those countries, political and economic reform to reinforce property rights and uh, a marketplace that actually works. And reduce corruption and reduce political decision making that yeah, stands in the way of freedom of commerce and freedom of contract. But if, if an American vice president stands for the proposition that there should be less freedom of contract and more central decision making, you're not going to get that kind of reform initiative, are you? No. One of our uh, senior fellows is an economist by the, by the name of George Ayiti, who is at American University. Uh, and he wrote, has written a number of books. And he's, and from, Ga he's from Ghana, let's he's also He's from Ghana, specify. and he uh, differentiates in, in Africa, uh, which is the major area he, he did his research in, between those people who are the producers versus the predators. Uh, and so he has some pretty colorful language about yes. <laughs> what well, he calls the different sides in these. Situations. You want to tell them what it is? No, I'm not sure it's ready for family time. Well, it, it's not that bad. <laughs> it, it's basically uh, d making the simple point that wealth production requires a rule of law and property rights and the freedom to make and create products and trade with other people versus conquering people and seizing their wealth uh, and either redistributing it to themselves or wasting it or giving it right. to interest. But George, George has some incredibly funny nicknames. Yes. Uh, anyway, uh, there's so much else going on and we have to remember, we do want to say at least something about the UFO since you responded. Oh yeah, let's, let's come to but, that but, at the end. Okay, but a couple things that I thought were pretty interesting was California providing an option for prospective teachers who can't pass an eighth grade competency test. So instead of having to pass this as a prerequisite for becoming a public school teacher, they're gonna have workarounds, they're gonna have options, they're gonna to look to other things. If you can't pass an eighth grade competency test, what are you doing in this classroom and what are taxpayers paying for? They're paying for the Re reduction of student learning, if that's what the kind of teacher. If you get three bad teachers in a row, this is a proven fact in education science. You are wrecked for life. Well, what's there? What's the reason behind it? Could it be that we shouldn't it's, shame it's, these teachers because after yeah. all, they've earned their credential, and we shouldn't put them through a shaming uh, process? We, we shouldn't. They shouldn't be ashamed of not knowing what they're supposed to know, and it may be. You know, the Armenians are doing better than the Azerbaijanis on this test. Well, it, it's another example of, again, getting back to Adam Smith, of creating a cartel. So you have a labor cartel, and the cartel controls the provision of teachers to local schools. Right. And it's policed by the government. And they do everything they can to eliminate their competition. Well, actually, this is, this is an interesting twist on all this. Because the test actually fosters a cartel in a sense, because it's reducing the number of people who can become teachers. Well, that's what Ide occupational Ide ideally, is. ideally, we wouldn't even want this test. What we would want is them to fire the incompetent teachers, but that's impossible politically. So this is a second best, third best, fifth best thing is to at least have a hurdle that they have to go through before they're locked in and we can never fire them. What I'm saying, Bill, is the fact they I don't understand. want the test is to protect the cartel. Because then they're, right. the public they obviously get... wants competent teachers right. and they're shielding people from access to that. Another horrible thing was this front page leak in all the papers about tax information. I can hardly believe that the private information from people's personal IRS files has been released. ProPublica originally released it and then it went viral. Mm -hmm. and, and some people are saying, oh, well, Bezos and Buffett and so forth, they don't deserve privacy for their tax returns. You know, 
I don't know that I admire those men entirely, but if they don't get privacy for their tax returns, am I going to have privacy for my tax returns? I mean, they have, you know, rooms, fleets of lawyers. Uh, the average person does not. So if these people can't have their, their tax records, their financial privacy protected, then nobody can. And, you know, this is also a case, people laugh off the idea of a deep state or a bureaucracy mm. that has political goals and tendencies and vetoes things and uses choke points and uses bureaucratic maneuvering in order to get its way for the policy that they would prefer. Well, you know, somebody leaked all these. There's only two ways it could get out. Somebody on the inside leaking mm -hmm. it out mm -hmm. or somebody hacking it, meaning they have inadequate protections. Either way, it is, you know, here's the IRS where we had deliberate attacking of conservative organizations during the Obama era. And, you know, they, <laughs> here's the president trying to incredibly increase taxes. And suddenly all this information that can be used in the narrative to support the president's agenda just happens to be leaked. It's very ugly when you don't have a more neutral bureaucracy it's than we seem to have. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's also an argument against having the government have this kind of tax power in the first place. And, mm -hmm. a, and, an, and an income tax lends itself to this in a way that other taxes America's don't. America's founders would not have looked kindly on the idea of having an income tax. And of course, I mean, the, 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 the way the tax is set up is that you're double taxed uh, with both corporate and individual taxes. But right. Uh, I, I think a lot of um, uh, liberals that rightfully are, have been concerned about the USA Patriot Act uh, seem to turn a blind eye to the powers the IRS has. Yes, I don't understand why the one is just not just as troubling as the other. I really don't understand. And I also am I'm, I'm disturbed by the reaction of many people who say, well, yeah, they probably shouldn't have leaked that stuff or hacked it, but, but these guys... But it was and, good and they, as, it's good the law was broken because these guys are breaking the law. By the way, at least the, the Biden administration said they were going to vigorously pursue what right. happened here. Go yes. for it. That's and what as, I Bill, say. as Bill Rifle has pointed out, it, it's, there's, you know, to believe this is a coincidence when they're talking about uh, getting people to pay their fair share, I don't think. And, and when Biden is developing whole fleets of additional investigators right. to go after the rich. Yes. Hey, it's not a coincidence. The, 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 and the other part of this is that uh, the rich uh, do not have enough wealth to pay for what Biden wants to fund. So right. it'll be a mass tax. The middle class. Right. There's no doubt. Exactly. There's not enough money to rid out of the rich. That's right. Well, but hey, you know, maybe the aliens are going to come on UFOs and deliver us from all these problems. What do you think? UFOs are all the rage now, aren't they? Uh, what do you guys think about that? Are, are you persuaded or should we, should we have an open mind that maybe these are from other universes or galaxies? I think, first of all, the Independent Institute welcomes... <laughs> Just kidding. I don't think we have an official <laughs> position on this, but we can still as individuals comment on what we think. Uh, David, you had some thoughts on this, I know. Well, I mean, the, the, the likelihood is that this is not extraterrestrial activity. I mean, the, the surveillance systems that exist globally that track foreign bodies are quite extensive, and there's no way even- So foreign bodies meaning things coming from outer space. That's right, and so if something came from outer space, we would know it. Uh, second is all these different objects are traveling in the atmosphere, uh, which means they are not intergalactic. They have to have air uh, to be able to move. Uh, and the, uh, so the possibility of there being other kinds of crafts that have been developed secretly in some, in some way by other governments or even privately is certainly possible. Maybe the U.S. government is doing it and trying to cover themselves. Who knows? Uh, but the point is that there is zero evidence that 
there are any extraterrestrial crafts that have ever been on Earth or around Earth. Exactly. And so I, I agree. The hoopla about, and this goes back to a, a bigger point about the nature of a lot of NASA research and so forth, is um, the ambition of a lot of these projects to go to Mars or to go to one of the moons of Jupiter or whatever, uh, to find water and so on, is to prove that uh, life can essentially uh, originate uh, spontaneously uh, in places other than the Earth. Now, maybe that's possible, but it's really, it's really a metaphysical question when it comes down to a lot of the motivation for this. So what I'm saying is that there's a huge amount of attention and tax-funded projects which are really, are really religious crusades. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the hoopla about the UFOs seems to fall into that category. Uh, you know, a lot of these specific videos, like the Navy ones, they're called Go Fast, FLIR, Gimbal, mm -hmm. and so forth, um, have been analyzed. And notwithstanding what you may hear on cable TV, um, most of them can well be explained uh, in different ways. Oftentimes, for example, these things might have been, as I have read, a seabird or a balloon distorted by the optical phenomenon of a parallax, yes. which is an effect that makes an object that's close to an observer filmed against a distant background seem to speed up. Um, right. uh, there are many explanations uh, without going to uh, the other galaxies. So I think we'll set that one to bed and, and feel a little bit more secure tonight. <laughs> you know, we've covered a lot of territory today. Um, thank you very much, David Thoreau, <clears throat> Bill Evers. I appreciate your incisive look at these issues. We thank all of our friends who've joined us through ThinkSpot and elsewhere. And uh, we will be back in a couple of weeks and see what's next to look at from an independent outlook. Okay. Thanks, David. Thank you. And Bill. Thank you. And we'll see you all next time. Thanks from the Independent Institute. Take care. <laughs>